Uh, I think we are already five minutes late, uh, so let's uh, get started. Um, Lauren, do you want to? Uh, we, we have three talks in the afternoon. Uh, each talk takes about an hour, uh, but included in the hour is uh, about 10 minutes, roughly uh, Q&A. So also at the very end of today's uh, talk, uh, between 5 and 6, it's both dinner time and uh, discussion time. If you want something more detailed, uh, or you want something uh, that may be a little bit too sensitive to discuss while you are being taped, uh, you can bring the questions to the uh, dinner where nothing will be taped, so you are free to say whatever. <laughs> Uh, thanks to Young for uh, inviting me here to talk. Uh, so as the title suggests, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, building our clean room. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we move tools in uh, as well. So I'm going to kind of go through some of the design phase and the, the building of the lab uh, somewhat quickly because Young's actually asked me to talk a little bit more about our moving experience uh, as well as the topic of nitrogen generation, which was actually one of the integral things that we put into the uh, design process. So I'll go through that in a lot greater detail. So I'll try to skip through the first part a little quickly here, so uh, just kind of bear with me. But I wanted to sort of set the tone for uh, the later part of the talk where I talk more about you know, how we actually conducted the move. Uh, so our lab, we're relatively small. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the actual clean room size uh, user base here in a minute. But uh, our lab now kind of fits into this broader culture on CMU's campus that we're calling the maker culture. So there's been renovations and uh, upgrades all over campus to bring more of this maker culture, uh, whether it be additive manufacturing, 3D printing, uh, in our case, uh, nanofab at both the nano and micron scales, um, and so on, into the university. Uh, so we'd like to think of ourselves as the, uh, the nano makers on campus. So the lab uh, in total, if we include all the facilities with uh, staff offices, mechanical spaces, so on, we're about 14,000 square feet. Uh, within that, I'll talk a lot here about our 8,500 square foot clean room. Uh, when it was commissioned, it was actually one of the most energy efficient in the country, which I'll discuss uh, briefly. Um, I believe that's since been surpassed. But uh, we support all of this right now with six technical uh, staff, including myself. Um, we are a hub for both the region uh, and the campus. We serve about eight to nine departments on campus in a given year. Um, we've had up to 200 uh, internal and external users in a given year. Uh, that number's actually gone down a little bit uh, post-pandemic. Uh, in fact, we were just having some conversations prior to uh, this session about that. But uh, we still do maintain uh, about 80 or so process tools and we work with up to 100 different materials. So we have a pretty broad set of users, pretty broad set of research going on in the lab. So see, these are some of the, the key research uh, themes or research areas that we deal with. So we do a lot with emerging computing technology, different types of logic and memory devices. Uh, we deal a lot with Internet of Things applications. We have a very active MEMS group, for instance, so we deal with a lot of different sensors and actuators related to that. Um, and I'm happy, you know, offline to go into more detail if anybody's interested. Uh, but we do a lot in energy research, um, but not necessarily traditional energy research. Uh, for instance, a lot of the emerging computing technology, Internet of Things based applications, a lot of those are actually uh, designed for ultra low power operations. So there's a lot of um, research uh, in energy harvesting and um, you know, using uh, harvested energy to drive devices like this that might be uh, low power. Uh, in addition, we're seeing a lot of growth in life science applications. So that's also driven some of our needs for different tools and, and processes within the clean room. Uh, so we do a lot with uh, biosensors, hydrogel electronics, protein scaffolds, we've done a lot of microfluidic devices, uh, and so on. Uh, so these are some of the, the key uh, research areas within that scope. So we, our, our lab actually was built largely off of magnetics and spintronics research over the years. 
And then starting in the 90s, we started to integrate a lot of MEMS and NEMS type devices as well. So that's really been, those two areas have really been some of the, the key focus of the lab and, and really have driven a lot of the equipment that we have. Uh, but now we've expanded into biointerfaces, bioelectronics, different oxides and resistive RAM applications. So I'll call these functional oxides. Photonics applications, 2D materials, and there's a lot more that I, I haven't listed here, but at least gives you some snapshot because this sort of plays into some parts later in the talk about you know, uh, the tool sets that we uh, work with and, and how we've designed some of the lab. Uh, so this is a quick snapshot of our capability. I'm not going to go through all of this list. Um, you know, you can find all of this on our website. Uh, so it just gives you some idea of what we're dealing with. And again, I'll discuss a little bit more of this as we go through the talk. Uh, but this is the team that we have now. Uh, now, I will say we've had actually uh, about half our staff turn over in the last year and a half. Uh, I know a lot of people were fighting similar issues. Uh, so, uh, for instance, Kevin and Neil uh, are both new hires. Neil's been with us for maybe about a year, Kevin only a few months, uh, as well as uh, AJ is our new technician here. So, uh, unfortunately, the three of them were not present for the move of the tools. Um, Mark, our equipment facility manager, was an integral part of the, the tool move. Uh, and Dante, one of our technicians, has also been an integral part of the tool move, as well as the ongoing uh, installation of new equipment and upkeep of the lab and so on. Uh, so I just want to kind of give a special thanks to them ahead of time here because you know, this group is really responsible for, for driving all of this. Um, so as I'll discuss, you know, we pretty much executed the entire tool move ourselves. Um, we were, you know, anything that required rigging, uh, you know, hiring the vendors for certain applications, we were in charge of, of dealing with all of that. We worked closely with EHS uh, to vet all the safety concerns <coughs> and we, you know, physically did most of the move and install ourselves. So. I have a lot more detail on that later, but uh, you know this team has really been responsible for uh, making that possible. All right, so talk a little bit about the actual design process, and then I'll get into some of the, the more uh, technical side of, of what we did, uh, at least with the nitrogen generation. So this is sort of the, the timeline of the whole process. Uh, so this, it, it, I sort of list this as starting in 2012. This actually dates all the way back to 2008 when site was determined for the building, initial design co concepts started to come to be, you know, in, in 2008. Um, different architecture firms were submitting uh, concepts and bids at that time. Uh, but it really wasn't until 2012 when we really got into the clean room design end. So four years later, we broke ground. Um, so you can see actually in the top here, the general construction for the broader building begins. Uh, so we broke ground. Um, it wasn't until about 2015 that the, uh, the walls and the ceilings for the clean room started to go up. And then that process happens really you know, pretty quick compared to the rest of the design process. So we really made sure to take our time in the design end and ensure that we have what we need before we actually start construction. Now, it's not to say things didn't change during the construction process. Um, you know, a lot of the points that, that Dennis had made really hit home uh, pretty hard because you know, we stayed very, very actively involved in reviewing documents and reviewing the design throughout the entire process. And there were a lot of things that were caught uh, sort of after the fact. In, in fact, I didn't even come into the project until 2015. So when I had all this kind of thrown in my lap, uh, it was sort of a daunting effort to, to catch up and you know, figure out where we were. A lot of decisions were already made by that point in the process. But uh, there were some key things that were caught uh, you know, prior to or during that construction phase that, uh, you know, we were able to change, uh, fortunately in time before it came a, a bigger issue. And, you know, I don't really have a lot of detail on some of those uh, items in the talk, but I'm happy to go into detail uh, offline if, if people want. But uh, basically the, uh, the lab was more or less finished and commissioned uh, in late 2016. We started to move tools in at that time as well. Uh, we didn't actually get our occupancy permit till February of 2017. Uh, and that's when we really started to move the broader tool set. And then fast forward about five years later, uh, our lab is now officially full as of October of 22. So uh, it was the first time that we decommissioned a piece of equipment and took it out of the lab to make way for a uh, new tool coming in. So it didn't take very long to go from, you know, what was considered a lot of open space to actually a full facility. Uh, so I'll comment a little bit on that as well. Now the design process, um, you know, was very involved. So uh, the site that we had was actually quite complicated. In the next slide, we'll, we'll highlight that a little bit more. Um, but basically, the clean room was was designed to fit in between a bunch of existing infrastructure on campus. 
Uh, CMU being uh, you know, pretty much in the city or in an urban area, there's not a lot of real estate to be had. So uh, we're very good at putting buildings where maybe they don't quite belong, and that was <laughs> basically one of the cases with this building. Uh, in fact, a lot of people over the years had said, do not build a building on this site, but we, we found a way. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that too, but uh, as far as the actual design process goes, um, so we really started with, you know, basically the site survey determining where uh, we were going to put everything. Uh, the vibration analysis uh, that we did was actually a key part of that in determining where the clean room would go. Um, we also looked heavily at tool move paths, which I'll talk about in more detail. Um, other utility requirements, gas distribution, how are we going to pull those utilities to the site. Um, you know, we talked about occupancy ratings uh, a lot in the morning. So that was also a, a big issue. You know, what are our chemical storage limits going to be? What fire safety requirements do we have to have? Uh, you know, and then you know other things, including you know based on the research we're doing, what classification of clean room do we need? Right. So once that uh, site location was determined, uh, <coughs> then we could actually just you know start the design and the layout. Now, one of the things that I'll point out here is that um, you know the clean room right now. This so this design concept here is actually showing a green roof. The clean room is underneath this green roof. Um, so basically, the uh, embeds that hold up the uh, air handlers are actually um, tied into the concrete that uh, serve that, that green roof area there. Uh, so it is watertight. That was a big concern of ours in putting a green roof you know, directly above the clean room. Uh, but uh, the, the architects did a good job in designing that, and, and we've been pretty happy so far. But as far as the design layout goes, um, we were really constrained by you know, the, the space allocated between these two different buildings. So again, the clean room is going right here in what used to be a parking lot. So you can actually see in the bottom image here, uh, this, this parking area is where the, the lab was built. Um, you know, again, this was largely determined by site surveys to look at vibration analysis. Um, if you actually look at the full construction site, it's, it's actually a pretty challenging area. So the broader Scott Hall building, which is where the nanofab is housed, um, is actually cantilevered out over a hill. So um, this picture on the bottom right kind of gives you an idea of some of the elevation changes that we're dealing with. Right? So it's a very, very complicated site. Uh, there was not any easy way to access bedrock, uh, so that was certainly a concern for vibration. And the original design actually had the clean room cantilevered <coughs> out on these stilts uh, over the parking lot. So you can imagine from a vibration standpoint, uh, this was not going to be an ideal situation, right? <clears throat> you know, they wanted this nice concept where you could have windows all around and bring in the natural light and so on, but the vibration, uh, you know, was really what drove the uh, site to be up in this uh, parking area. And this is actually on bedrock. It may not seem like it because we're up on the top of this hill, but um, it was actually relatively easy to, you know, put a slab on grade clean room uh, there with, with good vibration specs. So you can kind of see as they, they constructed the site, again, the clean room is sort of up here between these two buildings, and then what we call the north wing of the building is cantilever, cantilevered out over this hill. So you can see during different phases of the construction, the stilts going in. Uh, this is actually the clean room being built up. Uh, you know, you can see this is where the green roof was going, so that was being built up in the parking area, and so on. So the actual build process was done in four phases. Um, and, and what we did was a, a clean build where everything was kept clean throughout the entire process. All materials were wiped down. Um, we didn't want to have to build a dirty lab and try to clean it up later because essentially you're never going to get it as clean as you can by starting clean to begin with. So phase one, uh, this is still when you're in you know, the dirtier parts of the construction, but we still had construction workers wearing shoe covers and constantly mopping and vacuuming and, and cleaning up after themselves. Uh, but then once phase two hit, uh, that's when they had to start wearing, you know, a little more restrictive uh, attire. So they had hair nets, shoe covers, gloves were worn. And this is where there's continual cleaning throughout the day. So people were constantly wiping and mopping things uh, all throughout the day. Even though we still have, uh, you know, a concrete floor, uh, but at this point you can see some of the uh, plenums going in, uh, some of the research units that went in the upper part of the plenum here. Uh, all of that was going in largely in phase two. So. You know, we were having people wipe and, and you know, kind of, you know, keep clean uh, throughout that process. And we even started to restrict some materials at that point. Now, once we hit phase three of the clean room, that's when a lot of the walls were up. 
Um, that's when the flooring, uh, the, the uh, vinyl ESD flooring started to go in and so on. So at this point, we actually have all the construction team in full clean room attire. I can tell you they weren't very happy because the air handling units weren't on and operational at that point. So, I mean, there are days where it's hitting 80, 85 degrees in the clean room and, you know, these guys are fully decked out in, in Tyvek suits and, and whatnot. So, not the most comfortable work environment. Um, so, you know, from a safety perspective, too, with the heat, you know, that was something that had to be taken into account. But uh, it was a much more restrictive process in terms of what was allowed in and uh, what activities we were allowed to do at that point. So, for instance, cutting, drilling, welding, all of those things, and, and this excludes orbital welding. Orbital welding, you know, of course, we still do in the active clean room. But any other types of uh, welding, for instance, cutting, drilling, sawing, uh, all of those things were really not allowed in the clean room at that point. Anything had to be prepped sort of outside, wiped down, and brought in clean. Uh, and then there were further restrictions on what materials were allowed and so on. And then finally, phase four is really when the clean room is pretty much up and operational. So full clean room protocols in effect. This is really, you don't get to this phase until you're pretty much right before the certification process. Um, now I will say uh, that there was one integral piece to this whole thing, and that was the hiring of a clean room protocol manager. So this person is effectively integrated with the construction team, but they actually work for us. So they work for the university. Our lab actually hired them. It was a temporary employment opportunity. Um, their job was basically to make sure, understand all of the, the clean room specs, under, understand what was supposed to be done in terms of uh, the build, the cleanliness protocols, everything, and then basically be on site to make sure that's actually happening. So they were essentially our eyes and ears throughout the entire process. And there were a number of things that were captured, and so that was a very integral part of making sure that this project actually was a uh, success. All right, so the turnover and certification, um, you know, I, I think John had talked a little bit about this, so pretty straightforward, I think pretty standard, you know, compared to uh, other labs. So, you know, during final certification, uh, basically we brought third party company and they balance all of the air, the exhaust, the water systems to make sure everything is distributed properly. Um, they check each filter and test for uh, pressure and flow through every single, uh, in our case, we have ALPA filters, 100% coverage throughout the, uh, the clean bays. So they went filter by filter, tested every one of those. Uh, all of the lab piping was leak tested and certified. And so ultimately, when they finished the, uh, the certification process, the lab actually classified, in terms of particle counts anyways, uh, at a level of, of class one and class 10. Now, we were not designing to that spec. Um, you know, our design was to be at class 10 and class 100 once all of the tools were moved in. So we did certify one class lower uh, as the uh, lab was empty, but then of course as we start moving tools in, you get increased particle counts and so on. Uh, but we still do regular counts and we are still within uh, acceptable levels for class 10 and, and class 100 space. And I should note, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but when we did open, we were actually considered one of the most energy efficient in the country. Uh, I don't really have any focus on um, the air handling system that enabled that, but I'm happy to talk about it later if anybody's interested. Uh, essentially, it was the use of you know, a, a number of low uh, horsepower fans, so basically putting fan walls in up to 23 research units throughout the 8,500 square foot space. Uh, open plenum design with very low static pressure and so on. So I can, like I said, get into more detail uh, on this offline, but I wanted to point this number out because uh, this was actually pretty impressive when it was measured. So uh, there was a study done, I think around maybe 2013, if I remember correctly, looking at average um, uh, energy use for standard clean rooms. And the average was somewhere around 2,300, uh, maybe 2,400 uh, cubic feet per minute per kilowatt. Uh, our lab actually came in at about 10,500 CFM per kW, so uh, quite a good number. Okay, so the specifications of the clean room, um, I guess first off, let me kind of highlight what our old lab looked like versus the, uh, the new lab. So the old lab was only about 4,000 square feet of, I'm not sure what happened there. Thank you. 
Okay, so our old lab, uh, we were actually buried in the basement of the oldest building on campus. Uh, so our old lab, we only had about 4,000 square feet of space. So we had the blue area was sort of our class 100 area. The um, yellow area was mostly where we did litho. We had some metrology, uh, for instance, we had an SEM, uh, direct right laser system, and a few other things back here as well. Um, so, you know, we had quite a, quite a few, uh, or, or quite, quite a bit more space to grow into. We did more than double the space in the new lab. But as I mentioned, we are already full. So I'll talk a little bit about that uh, as we go here. But the, uh, the new lab is about 8,500 square feet under the clean envelope. Uh, I should mention that our, clay, our chases are part of that clean envelope. Uh, so the way the uh, design is set up, our chases are the return air path back to the research units. Uh, so our clay chases we consider to be you know, roughly class 100 and class 1000 space. Uh, so we you know, do uh, observe clean protocol in the chases as well. So if you take all of the space into account, about 20% of it would be class 10, 30% of it class 100. Uh, so really the clean space is about half of the, the total space uh, where we have the uh, area under filter and then the chases make up you know, another about 50% of the space. Uh, it is a slab on grade design. Uh, it's actually a thick, 16 inch thick slab uh, throughout the lab. Uh, so this was done again to meet vibration specs. Uh, if you look at the layout of the lab, um, the, the class 100 area is mainly concentrated in the first four bays. Uh, the back half of the lab here is where we do a lot of the litho. That's our class 10 space. Uh, we have three shielded electron beam rooms. That's also considered class 10 space. Uh, each of those electron beam rooms is actually uh, wrapped in iron, silicon, steel, and aluminum panels for EMI mitigation. Uh, although, just a quick comment uh, relating back to York's talk this morning. So, you know, there was a, a comment about uh, if you're not careful, potentially amplifying vibration. One of the things that actually came up with these E-beam rooms, right, we, so we wrapped the entire, you know, room in this, this uh, metal shielding including the floor. In fact, the floor was actually made as a double stack, so it was about three quarter inch thick metal. And so prior to that going in, this area was all tested. We all met, it, all of this area met the vibration specs needed for our most stringent tool, which is our electron beam lithography system. Uh, and, and by the way, a lot of the lab was designed to specific tool specs, and I'll comment about that when we get into the boot part. But basically, um, the, uh, the E-beam rooms with all the metal amplified uh, any vibration. So actually people walking across the metal flooring, huge vibration uh, through the flooring. Uh, actually at one point we measured a, uh, an amplitude about 40 times uh, what we had measured prior to the, uh, the flooring going in those spaces. So all kinds of things were tried, they, they including you know, anchoring uh, that floor every so many inches, uh, trying to anchor it to the concrete. Uh, really, it, it, it helped, but none of it actually allowed it to pass spec. So when we installed our E-beam system in the room, we actually had a core drill down through that metal, put the feet of the tool on vibration isolation pads on the concrete, right? So we actually had to sort of degrade the shielding to an extent in order to meet the vibration specs for the tool. Um, we also have issues with trains nearby. So uh, basically, if you look at the layout of this lab, I'd shown that uh, one north wing of the building sort of cantilevered out over a hill. So that part of the building, relative to, to this drawing here, that part of the building would be out here. And so kind of you know, where this other screen would be, there's actually a set of train tracks here. Um, we have large freight trains that come through there periodically. And they're producing enough quasi-DC field up in this room that we also had to add a, uh, an active mitigation system for the, uh, the EMI. So, there was a lot of measures taken to actually meet the, uh, the E-beam specs uh, in this space. So just a couple, couple design notes. Um, so in addition to the shielded rooms, uh, we have 19 wet chemistry decks that we added. Uh, this is a, uh, an H5 occupancy rating, so there were quite a bit of uh, attention that had to be paid to you know, uh, fire safety systems uh, and, and other things to, uh, you know, to, to meet the H5 spec. Um, I will note that uh, you know there was a good comment this morning about floor drains. Uh, we did lose that battle, so unfortunately we do not have any floor drains in the lab. Uh, it has flooded twice, so uh, you know that's something that we've had to deal with. We actually went, went in with the assumption that this lab will flood at some point in its lifetime. Uh, we dealt a lot with that in this old lab, being in the basement of the oldest building on campus. Uh, we weren't. Uh, it, we were certainly used to floods from time to time. 
So we did take uh, all of that into account with the uh, tool installations and try to ensure that we kept everything up off the floor as much as possible uh, so that we could actually clean any water up. Okay. Uh, in addition, uh, we have class one, division two uh, chemical and gas storage areas in the basement. We have an exterior silane pad down over the hill adjacent to the building and so on. Uh, so we actually have in these rooms sort of a toxic, toxic gas bunker that then allows us to you know, distribute gas up to a set of valve manifold boxes on the back wall of the clean room. Okay. So I'm not going to get into all the design specs on that, but again, I'm happy to talk uh, offline about it if, if uh, anybody's interested. <coughs> okay. So in terms of facility and utility distribution, uh, so the lab was really designed with the ultimate flexibility in mind. Uh, this largely fit into uh, the methodology that we used for moving the tools. So basically, every few feet, we have taps for argon, nitrogen, oxygen. These are all uh, ultra high purity. Uh, every couple of feet, we have uh, supply and return taps for processed chilled water. Um, the walls are very modular. Uh, the slab on grade design also helps us move equipment around uh, very easily as well. I'll, I'll, that, I'll talk again more about that as we go here. Uh, the gases, uh, electronic gases, those, uh, so again, the argon, oxygen, nitrogen, so your inerts essentially are all plumbed uh, to each chase wall with a tap every few feet. Uh, so it makes tool tie-ins easy, but then the electronics gases, uh, they start at these dual cylinder auto crossover gas panels uh, that we have, and then they are supplied to individual distribution manifolds in the chases where those tools are housed. So the electronics gases right now really only go to uh, two of the main chase areas. And so if you're looking at this, the widest chases is where we bulkheaded a lot of the etching tools that use those gases, for instance. So we have distribution manifolds on uh, each chase wall in those areas. Uh, again, chilled water taps are plumbed everywhere. DI water taps are plumbed everywhere. Um, we have 12 inch and two inch exhaust uh, taps all throughout the facility as well. So we try to put taps in everywhere to make this very modular and make uh, the ability to move tools around and install to tools as needed very flexible. Uh, this does come at a cost, so you know, of course you have to put all this infrastructure in uh, at fairly high cost, but I can assure you that it is saving us a lot of cost on the back end because, again, our staff really do most of the installation on new equipment and we did pretty much all of the moving installation as well. So uh, this really was, was a key uh, thing in doing that. We also put a 200 amp electrical panel at the end of every chase wall, or I should say each end of every chase wall. And then in the largest chases, so we have two 16-foot wide chases, uh, those chases actually have uh, each one two 600 amp panels kind of directed right in the center of the chase. Okay, so again, it makes running electric, makes running uh, a lot of other facilities uh, very easy. Um, I, I'm just gonna go through this slide relatively quickly, but one, one key thing to note is, you know, look at your areas of redundancy. This has actually been a big concern for us. So a lot of the systems that we work with are not fully redundant. So this is something that sort of got, you know, with that, the term value engineering came up earlier, right? So these are some of the things that maybe got value engineered to a point where it is a little bit concerning. So for instance, the makeup air unit, uh, it, it, we have a single makeup air unit. Uh, it does have redundant fans and we were assured that the uh, system is redundant. However, we've been able to, uh, by experience, identify multiple single points of failure over the years. And actually, a lot of these, believe it or not, are tied to control systems and not directly within the makeup air unit themselves. So we've had quite a few things take down the makeup air. Um, the exhaust system is fully redundant, but if one fan goes down, it takes uh, quite a bit of time for the second fan to actually ramp up and get to speed. Uh, so that causes some other issues with makeup air as well. Process chilled water is fully redundant with two pumps, two heat exchangers, um, and we can rotate any combination of those. Um, DI water is only partially redundant. Compressed air is only partially redundant. All these things have single points of failure, even though they're modular or, or have you know, multiple pumps or, or compressors and so on. Um, they may all be tied to say one single controller, for instance. So just something to think about as you're moving forward with design, you know, building that redundancy in, um, it, it, in, in my opinion, it is really key. Now, as far as redundancy goes and as far as facility distribution goes, nitrogen was really one of the things that we took a, a hard look at when we, we built the lab. So I'm a big advocate for nitrogen generation. Um, I know in our case, it's been a, a huge advantage for us, right? So prior construction and during construction, we really took a, a hard look at 
our nitrogen usage and what is possible. So, you know, we looked at the various sources. Of course, you have your bulk liquid nitrogen. I think, you know, most fabs are using bulk liquid nitrogen vapor, you know, to a large degree. Uh, there's, of course, the generated nitrogen, which I'm going to talk about here. Uh, you have bottled nitrogen, and then uh, the purified nitrogen is actually uh, what we get by taking the bulk liquid nitrogen and running it through a bank of, of purifiers. Uh, and in fact, in our case, that's where we get our actual uh, process nitrogen. Now, in looking at these, there are a number of things that you have to take into consideration, right? So, um, you know, for us, we looked at where are each of these nitrogen feeds going to go and what type of grade or what type of quality nitrogen do we need, right? So, of course, you've got your high purity process nitrogen. You've got uh, chamber vent gas. Uh, does that need to be the same as the high purity process nitrogen? Not in every case. Uh, you have gas cabinet purges, uh, so these are the head casings in the gas cabinets. You have the head casings uh, in the wet decks. You have your venturi feeds for the gas cabinets. Uh, you have, you know, purges on various turbo pumps, dry pumps, scrubbers, uh, things like that, so different abatement systems. And then within the wet decks, I already mentioned the, uh, the head casing purge, but you also have your nitrogen guns, you have liquid level sensors and process baths. So there's quite a few uses of nitrogen across the lab that you need to take into consideration. Um, one of the other things that really scared us when we looked at the numbers was, uh, I didn't mention on the earlier slide, but we added in the clean room 19 brand new wet chemistry decks. Uh, each of those decks required at least 50 cubic feet an hour. So we're pushing roughly about 1,000 cubic feet an hour just for, the, just for this head casing purge alone. Uh, some of the pumps that we use, so we have relatively old pump set. And when we moved from the old facility to the new, we got rid of any oil-filled pumps, went to dry pumps for pretty much everything. Some of the pumps that we have consume a huge amount of nitrogen. Uh, so we have some pumps that will take up to 55 liters per minute of, of nitrogen, so uh, quite a bit of use in there alone. So we actually figured out that we would add, uh, you know, 1,000 CFH for our wet decks. There were actually four other wet decks as part of the project that went in another area of the building that we were going to be responsible for feeding. So there's another 300 to 400 cubic feet an hour. The upgrade of the pumps we looked at and said, okay, we're going to be adding at least 500 cubic feet per hour uh, as well. And then, of course, you know, all of the uh, gas panels that we have also use a significant amount of nitrogen. So compared to what we were using in the old facility, the, the usage was going to spike tremendously when we opened this lab. Uh, and at the time, we were already spending what we considered a small fortune on using bulk liquid nitrogen to supply everything. Not to mention the fact that we only had a 1,500-gallon tank, and it got to a point where we were actually filling this thing every two to three days. Our vendor was great at keeping up with us, but it was certainly not an ideal situation by any means, right? So, um, so actually within that, I, there's one other thing I should note here. So we did take into some special considerations for nitrogen purity as well. And I actually have a chart on the next slide to really highlight, um, you know, purity to a greater extent. So when determining the uses for these nitrogen, you really, or the, the uses for the different grades of nitrogen, you really need to take into account what the impurities are, what's the process, what are the, the specs needed for that nitrogen uh, flow, right? So if you look, you know, generated nitrogen, it's going to be at a lower percentage. Um, you have, you know, much more oxygen contamination, much more water vapor uh, in there as well. Bulk liquid nitrogen, you know, you have a significant improvement. Uh, ultra high purity nitrogen from bottled sources, uh, it gets even better. And then as you go through uh, purifiers, you can really polish this all the way down to part per billion levels. Um, so this was really reserved just for the most stringent of processes. But using some of these specs in mind, um, you know, we had to, to do a careful analysis for each individual tool as to what feeds were going to uh, go to it. For instance, if you're, pump, if you're uh, dealing with uh, corrosive gases, you don't necessarily want to take a uh, nitrogen feed that has a high level of water vapor or oxygen contamination and use that in your turbo perch. Right? So these are all, all the little things, that, all the little details that we had to go through. So in the end, we kind of came up with this chart, right? So we do have all four grades of this nitrogen in the facility right now. Um, you know, the uh, purified liquid nitrogen boil off that's getting up to maybe six or so nines, uh, that's again really reserved for the most stringent applications. So we basically took the approach that anything that is touching a wafer, uh, so for instance, uh, the uh, vacuum processing, so reactive sputtering for instance, 
um, or uh, anything that's going into an edge tool and so on. Any purge gas that uh, we use, for instance, like in our PCBD when we pump purge the, uh, the manifold on the PCBD, for instance. Uh, all of that we're using the, uh, the processed nitrogen. Ultra high purity nitrogen is uh, still pretty clean, so we actually use that for uh, vent gas in some applications. We use that for, uh, or actually, I'm sorry, this is the uh, bottled nitrogen. So this is really only used in, in select cases where we use uh, like purge gas for the, uh, the gas panels. So all the corrosive gases, for instance, um, when we have to purge out those gas panels, uh, that is coming from a bottled source, mainly because it really needs to be isolated from a, high, uh, a house system. So you don't necessarily want to take all of your corrosive and toxic gases and, and purge them from a system that can be cross-contaminated. So we have isolated bottles uh, on those applications. Uh, our utility nitrogen, uh, or at least what we're calling utility nitrogen, which is the boil off from our liquid tank, uh, that goes to uh, chamber venting. Um, we also filter that because it's running through copper lines. Uh, critical turbo purges, uh, gas cabinet venturi feeds, and so on. Uh, and then really where we have what we call waste gas applications, that's where we implemented the nitrogen generation, and that's actually where a huge amount of our cost savings came in. So we use this, for instance, for wet deck purges, dry pump purges that are not handling, for instance, uh, toxic or corrosive materials. Uh, the pneumatics for the gas panels, uh, and then again, all other waste gas applications like purging the head casings for uh, wet decks, for instance. All right, so this is how it's distributed at the moment. So we still have our bulk liquid tank. In fact, we upgraded to a larger size. Um, technically, we probably should have gone larger, but there were some limitations on the site. So we have a 3,000 gallon uh, liquid nitrogen uh, tank in place next to the facility. Uh, we bought a generator. Uh, I'll talk about that process here as well. But we bought a generator, installed that in the basement of the facility, uh, or actually in the basement of the building next door. Um, so unfortunately, we had to run almost 1,000 feet of piping to get everything up to our lab and then distribute it all through the lab. So the install of this, because of the site location, was uh, pretty significant. So just something to keep in mind. So uh, these systems also, by the way, are, are large and need to be indoors. Uh, this system, and I'll talk about the system design, but basically uh, it's kind of like a twin tower desiccant dryer if you want to make a comparison. And it's actually 13 feet tall. Uh, so, you know, finding an indoor space that houses um, both a 13-foot uh, tall generator and a 1,000-gallon receiver tank, also around 13 feet tall, is not an easy task. Fortunately, the uh, adjacent building had such a space, uh, which is why we chose to plummet over such a large distance. Uh, but basically, once the nitrogen comes up, we actually have a, a distribution manifold here. So the liquid nitrogen uh, boil off ties into this manifold, as does the generated nitrogen. And then uh, I can cross over different feeds to really anywhere I want. The new clean room, uh, the broader Scott Hall building that houses the new clean room, silane pad. Uh, at the time, the old clean room, which is now being decommissioned, and so on. All right, so uh, this is just a little bit more uh, about how we handle those feeds in the clean room. So um, again, we have the boil off coming in. Uh, that feed gets split, so half of it goes, or, or part of it goes to uh, nitrogen purifiers to get our processed nitrogen out. Um, part of it continues on uh, <laughs> and is distributed with taps all throughout the lab. So again, we have taps every few feet for purge nitrogen, utility nitrogen, processed nitrogen, et cetera. Right, so again, it gives us that flexibility that we needed to do uh, tool installs and so on. So this just is a little snapshot of kind of the, how this all evolved, uh, a little bit of a history here. So you know, we saw significantly rising costs in the liquid nitrogen uses all the way back in 2014. Uh, and again, the new fab wasn't started uh, in, in construction until you know, you know, 2015. We didn't actually finish the fab until 2016. So throughout that time, we spec'd out this generator. We did all this analysis. And then early 2017, we actually purchased, or actually, it's, sorry, late 2016, we actually purchased uh, the nitrogen generator. Uh, this is. Actually, I should uh, update this. So this was purchased earlier in 2016. It was installed and started up um, pretty much right before we opened the new fab. Uh, so it almost coincided with the opening of the new fab. And it also coincided with the installation of the 19 wet decks in the clean room and the four wet decks in the other part of the building. Uh, so at that point, the fab opened, the move began. Um, we also, again, um, actually, this should be, I apologize, this should be kind of moved up in time here. but. 
Um, we also installed the 3,000 gallon liquid tank. Um, it, right before that happened, again, we were filling this 1,500 gallon tank every two to three days, which was kind of ridiculous. Um, and then we also actually managed, even though we were going to sort of offload some of our usage to this generator, we still managed to renegotiate our liquid nitrogen contract uh, at the same time. So fast forward a few years, that the move, uh, which I'll talk about here shortly, ended uh, in late 2020. Uh, since that time, we've been more or less in a steady state. So we refill our tank now once a week, which is still on average actually a you know pretty, uh, pretty short time span between fills. But we do keep this uh, tank at a capacity of about 40%, just so uh, everybody's aware. And, and part of that is to build in redundancy. So if I look at the actual cost of all this and the, the cost of the usage over time, um, you know, you can take that timeline and you can chart this out over the years. And you can see in blue, this is our M2 expenditure. This is also, this is just for liquid nitrogen. Um, and this is the, uh, the, the total usage. And so you can see that usage and expense was increasing dramatically. In fact, expense was increasing faster than the usage at one point because of, of continually changing rates. So we installed the generator at the same time that we renegotiated our liquid nitrogen contract. So you see this massive drop in usage. Now, I should note that this drop in usage is the drop in liquid nitrogen usage. We actually significantly increased our overall nitrogen usage in the same amount of time. But the total cost of all the nitrogen combined actually dropped massively at that point. So you know, at this point, I kind of stopped this trend line right before the pandemic because things look a little goofy throughout that point. But you know, this is essentially the trend we're on now. So I mean, it is increasing again. Uh, we actually are right now in the process. In fact, we just finished renegotiating our uh, liquid nitrogen contact contract again. So we are going to benefit from another slight price drop here. But um, the the point of this is that we saw essentially a massive cost savings. Right? Now uh, I'm kind of running a little short of time, I want to get to the, the equipment move here. So I'll, I'll kind of just uh, breeze through this quickly. And I know that you guys have the slides here. So if anybody's interested in uh, talking about more of the details, um, there are a number of different types of nitrogen generation. Uh, we opted for the uh, pressure swing absorption type of design. Um, so this is sort of the point on this uh, chart that we're operating on. right? So if you look at nitrogen flow requirements versus uh, purity, you know, there's different ways to supply it from bulk liquid nitrogen to pressure swing absorption, membrane technology, and having your own cryo plant. Um, so we're kind of uh, right here on this uh, chart. So right where bulk liquid uh, kind of merges with the pressure swing absorption. All right. uh, I won't really get too much into the technology. Um, you know, I just wanted to kind of highlight some of this quickly. Um, I will say that our generator right now, it's spec to produce 99.9% .9 nitrogen. Uh, we're actually getting a little bit better than that. We're almost getting four nines out of it. The cost of a generator does increase significantly as you increase purity. So you can get these from 99% to 99.5 to three nines, all the way up to four nines, and so on. Uh, but again, cost does go up. Uh, we're producing about 3,000 cubic feet an hour. And you know, on average, it's probably running at about 2,000 cubic feet an hour. So if I factor all of that in, I actually, uh, I'm saving six figures a year right now. Uh, because of this generator being in place. Um, I'll talk a lot more about the air specs and all the other things that go into this. I'm going to kind of skip through in the interest of time. Um, I will say that uh, you know the generators are extremely robust. So the biggest point of failure for a nitrogen generation system is actually going to be the, uh, the air compressors that run it. So a lot of thought really needs to be taken uh, into account when you are designing this system, what kind of air compressors you're going to use. Uh, one thing actually that we were surprised about that nobody had pointed out in the design process is that uh, I kind of you know talked earlier about how this sort of uh, is similar to a uh, twin tower desk and dryer. Uh, so essentially what happens is in this pressure swing absorption technology you have a carbon molecular sieve that sits in these towers, it's densely packed, you flow compressed air through, oxygen, water vapor, they attach themselves to that sieve, allows the nitrogen to flow out. Uh, and then you have to do a blow down of that tower to release all of those uh, you know, oxygen molecules and uh, all the water vapor out through uh, basically a muffler system. The problem is these large towers cycle every 60 seconds. So this was not something that was brought to our attention. 
And what we found is they just beat the hell out of the air compressors. Because the air compressors, we have variable speed drives on those compressors that are just constantly working, uh, working overtime, in fact. And so, um, you know, we have to look now maybe at putting a larger receiver tank on the air compressors to kind of buffer that um, or, or do something else altogether. So um, just a couple design notes if you are considering a system like this. Um, but uh, maintenance overall is relatively cheap. I won't get too much into the maintenance costs here. But again, I'm happy to talk more about it offline. Um, but I wanted to get to this slide most importantly. So I did a lot of calculations of ROI. And it's kind of, I can tell you that in our particular case, return on investment was actually about one year. Um, but it, there's a lot of factors that go into this. So I, I kind of put a list of assumptions here when I was calculating what would be considered worst case scenario versus what we actually had. Um, I will say that our nitrogen generator, because it was part of the de building design process, we were able to include some of the piping in the actual build uh, for the clean room. And so that wasn't necessarily included in the uh, cost calculations for that ROI. Uh, a couple other things to take into account were, you know, if you're going to buy a fully redundant system with two completely independent air compressors, uh, you know, of course, that adds to your cost. Purity level adds to your cost. So I did a, a rough estimate, and I'm happy to, again, talk offline about these numbers, but I did a rough, est rough estimate of what would be considered sort of a worst case scenario, and we came up with a break-even point of about three years uh, in that particular case. I would say that on average, and, and this is, there's a lot of data out there on this, uh, on average, your ROI in a lot of cases is maybe around the two-year mark. Uh, so worst case, maybe three years, a lot of cases, two years. Uh, we had some help in procurement. And we were able to push parts of this project into other um, ongoing projects, which really helped us get almost like a one-year uh, ROI out of it. So again, just a couple things to, to take into account. All right, so I'm going to shift gears a little bit. And I apologize if I'm going a little bit fast here, uh, but I don't want to go too far over here on time. Um, so the other big thing that I was going to talk about now that you know kind of gave you the lay of the land on the, on the lab was actually the tool move and the execution plan. So the planning process was significant. The planning process started all the way back in 2012, well before the lab was even built. Um, and I can't emphasize enough how important it is to work out those processes as early as possible. So the process, and this was actually done as part of the build to determine the facility distribution, uh, the layout of the clean room and so on, we actually started with a full utility matrix for each of the tools. So we took every tool that we have, but we also planned for future tools. We had a long wish list of equipment that we would like to acquire over the years, and we essentially put that in the project that, that aided in the clean room design. In fact, um, a lot of the design specs, uh, both sizes of bays in some cases, the e-beam rooms, the vibration specs, all of those were actually designed on tools we didn't currently own but wanted to own. Right, so we took into account all of the, uh, the future equipment. Uh, and there was a comment in, in uh, one of the earlier talks actually about uh, tool move paths and not being able to fit things through uh, openings and so on. So that was also something that was examined through this and I'll, I'll comment on as well. But the idea was that we started with this utility matrix to understand all of the specs of the equipment, uh, what would be involved with the move and so on. Uh, and this kind of predates me actually coming to the project, but it was kind of decided early on that the mm -hmm. NanoFab staff would be the ones responsible for moving the equipment. So we didn't go with the, you know, take everything down, move it within a few week time span, get everything back up and running. We wanted to basically take the approach of how do we minimize the disruption to research. So in that case, we actually uh, decided to move one tool at a time, get it online before the next tool was even uh, taken offline to, to move. Um, through that, you know, we were able to minimize cost. I'll, I'll comment on that as well. Um, and then, you know, a lot of the planning really revolved around what are the safety concerns. So not only for things like toxic gases and chemicals that you have to worry about, but what safety concerns do we encounter, you know, in the actual move itself? The move path. I showed some of the elevation involved with the uh, the new building. So we were in the basement of a uh, an old facility. We had to go up several stories to get to the new building. So. Rigging, moving, there was a safety concern, you know, based both for the people working on that equipment and then, you know, also uh, concern for equipment damage itself through that process, right? So all of these things had to be vetted early on. Um, so with that in mind, 
um, you know, we started out early trying to establish a tool budget, right? So we took that utility matrix, and here's one example of what that looks like. So we look at the actual tool dimensions, we look at all the utilities that go into that tool, um, you know, what spec gases do, uh, does it need, what are the vibration specs, uh, that we look at all the individual fittings and connections and so on. And so, you know, as we establish the budget, we really try to, um, you know, standardize as much as possible on types of fittings, types of piping, methodology for the install, and so on. Um, you know, we did, uh, as we started to, to go through this process, leverage uh, what we call term service contracts on campus. So CMU were actually fortunate enough through our facilities group to have contracts that have fixed labor pricing and uh, fixed material markups and so on. So what they do is they bid <coughs> multiple contractors. So if I want orbital welding done, for instance, they would have previously bid to multiple companies that can do the orbital welding. And through that bid process, we actually get to go and contract that vendor without having to procure new bids because essentially the pricing was fixed in those contracts. So that was something that aided us tremen tremendously in terms of the, uh, the install. So especially for electric uh, and orbital welding. Um, we also tried to you know, order materials in bulk where we uh, could and so on. And so all in all, after we came up with this budget, we were able to execute this for actually uh, pretty low, low cost. We actually did this for under a million dollars. In fact, actually it was under 900K. All right, so um, you know, once we sort of flushed out what the budget looks like and what the process is gonna look like, then the other thing that we really had to look at was determining you know, what were the move paths going to be for the equipment. Right? So this was done early enough that we could actually incorporate some of these requirements uh, in the design process and in the build of the, uh, the broader building. Right? So there were a couple uh, compromises that had to be made, a couple things that ended up being a huge concern. Um, so we did, again, take a look at all the tool sizes, tool weights, um, and you know, originally in the project we had a, a nice large freight elevator that would fit 100% of the equipment that we wanted to move. Um, despite the fact, actually I made a note down here, um, the, the loading dock that we were working with wouldn't necessarily be able to handle all the equipment. So uh, I'll get to that in a second. But uh, unfortunately, this is uh, one of the cases, well, I don't know if I'd call it value engineering, it was more of a space compromise. Uh, so the freight elevator ended up being taken out of the project and we got a combo freight and passenger elevator with a 5,000 pound capacity, an eight foot depth and a five foot door opening. So that accommodated yeah, maybe about 85% of the tools, but uh, we did have some large tools that were definitely of concern. Uh, so what we had to do early on was establish a secondary path for those large tools. So uh, for instance, we have a production level sputtering system, uh, eight foot long, six foot diameter, 5,000 pounds. That tool could never make it through that elevator. Uh, we had plans to get a new optical stepper. So we uh, had a, a stepper come in about 10,000 pound capacity uh, or 10,000 pound uh, weight load. And so we had to make sure that we could handle that as well. So we designed all of the hallways with eight foot minimum widths. All of the height clearances were determined to be 10 foot. Um, turns out there was one issue. So it actually ended up being nine and a half feet later on because one doorway didn't make the 10 foot clearance. But it, it hasn't been an issue on that side. Um, but there were a couple other things uh, of concern. So. Uh, I mentioned that we are slab on grade, and they poured this 16-inch slab, uh, you know, through the or through the building for us, um, and that'll handle the 10,000-pound load capacity that we needed. However, right before we move large tools into our downing room, uh, we're in a cafe that is over one of our mechanical rooms, and we could not get the structural engineers to sign off on a 10,000-pound load. So, uh, you know, we can get 10,000 pounds all the way up to the general area of the clean room entrance, but then the weight limit goes down to 5,000 pounds, or at least that's what they would sign off on. Um, so, you know, definitely some issues to contend with. Um, so, actually, in the case of the 10,000 pound tool, we had to hire a company to come in, basically put scaffolding in the basement and jack up the floor so we could handle the extra weight loads. Right, so there was a lot of uh, engineering design that had to be put just into the tool move itself. Right, so if you look at the layout here, so there's two ways that we access the clean room. So that secondary move path, we actually come in from a parking lot down in the right-hand corner, uh, you know, kind of wrap around this hallway. And again, this is all the 10,000 pound load capacity. But then this area right here is where this cafe is located. And to get into our gowning room, which is really the main way we get large tools into the clean room, 
Uh, this is where we had to basically shore up the floor to ensure that we can, you know, bring the, the tool in. Uh, but that said, uh, you know, it did work. Um, so our gallon room right now doubles largely as the, the tool move-in area. So, um, you know, we designed all of the, uh, the galling space to be kind of modular. We can move racks and things around as needed. So if we bring a large tool in, we can do the wipe down right there in the gallon room. Um, and then it would come along this main clean corridor. And again, we kept the eight foot clearance and the 10, eight foot width and 10 foot height clearances uh, all along this clean aisle so we can easily get to any of the, uh, the bays that we need to. Uh, any smaller equipment, we actually have a staff downing area in the back corner here, uh, and we have our electron beam chase, so we can actually bring a lot of uh, smaller tools in through that way as well. So we have a couple options for moving equipment. Uh, so in the end, um, you know, tool layouts were really one of the, the critical things in doing this. And so this is another thing I would stress developing early. So I already talked about that tool matrix, right? So that tool matrix we designed for our tool set, it ended up being about 300 pages of uh, details on, again, tool size, tool weight, all the facility connections, and so on. So we worked with the design engineers early on to develop uh, detailed tool layouts of not only the tools that were in that matrix, but again, future tools that we had planned out. So it may look like the lab is full here on day one when we have a tool layout for a lab that doesn't even exist. Uh, so you know, it looks like we didn't actually have any upgrade space but that's not entirely true because there were a number of pieces of equipment on this tool layout that, again, did not exist currently uh, when, we, when we went through that design process. But again, this was integral and really, you know, we did a lot of late night shuffling of things around, many, many hours of meetings, uh, you know, to try to determine, you know, are we sectioning off the clean room correctly? Are we putting codependent tools in the right places near each other? Uh, things like that. So, for instance, um, we have uh, we do a lot of aluminum nitride deposition uh, in our lab, and so that has to go hand in hand with uh, thickness measurement and stress measurement. So, we put those metrology tools nearby the uh, aluminum nitride system. Uh, all the tools running the toxic gases have to go to the abatement system. So, we have to make sure that all of that is in close proximity here uh, in one area of the lab, and we try to keep those areas sort of isolated from. Uh, other equipment and so on. So again, a lot of planning went into this, and ultimately what we ended up with was six bays, seven chases, three e-beam rooms, and then an eighth e-beam chase, where we've grouped, you know, largely thin film deposition and some metrology in one area, etching and plasma, uh, or plasma etching uh, and, and some metrology uh, kind of in the middle of the lab here. Um, here we sort of get a crossover between uh, thin film deposition and etching. Uh, we keep a lot of the high hazard chemical processes and our CVDs and so on uh, in bay four here. So this is all uh, of our acid decks, for instance. Uh, and then we have three CVD systems on the left hand side that use different toxic materials. Um, the back part of the lab here, this is where we get into our class 10 space. So this is almost all wet chemistry here in bay five. So this is all sample prep, uh, photoresist development, uh, photoresist stripping, uh, things of that nature. And then base six is, is largely devoted to uh, lithography. So we have our stepper in the back corner here. And one of the things you'll notice is base six is actually a little bit wider than the other bays, and that was to accommodate the larger body of the stepper that we wanted to put in. Right? So again, we customized the size of all the chases, all the bays, to kind of fit the, the tool sets that we had in mind, and to fit the, uh, the, re the flow of research that we had in mind. Okay. So as far as the project timeline goes, um, you know, originally we tried to map this out over a shorter time span and realized that it just wasn't going to be feasible for us to do this in, say, one year with the staff that we had and the fact that we were executing pretty much the whole project ourselves. Um, so this is the Gantt chart of, you know, how we planned this out. So as we were planning it, you know, again, we were trying to minimize the disruption to research. Move one tool, get it online before we start the next tool. So uh, the sequencing was very important. We had a basically you know, involve the broader faculty, the broader user base of the lab, and understand what research conflicts do you have, what research deadlines do you have. You know, if we have, for instance, um, you can see here, uh, I have this, this point here to, to moving codependent tools at the same time. So this is where our PECVD, our chlorine etcher, and our scrubber all had to move at the same time because all of those processes, basically, well, the, the PECVD and the chlorine etcher at least rely on the same abatement system. Um, so this was actually almost a two-month project. 
So we chose to do it kind of around the holidays where the contractors are willing to work, work over our winter break. And so we could kind of, you know, save some uh, downtime that way when people aren't going to be in the facility or uh, on campus. Right? So there were a lot of factors involved in, in moving tools and, and, you know, what that order was uh, and so on. Uh, and, and overall, we really ended up uh, with very few con uh, conflicts, right? So when it came down to the actual execution, uh, I, I mentioned earlier, we really tried to standardize as much as possible. So we tried to standardize fittings. Um, a lot of tools, you know, we, we took a, a, a very practical approach to things. So if we, you know, have a tool that doesn't require orbital welding, you know, our staff did all of this with uh, swage lock fittings, and we do leak test them all the way down to, you know, 10 to the minus 8 tour leak rates and so on. Uh, Jedco fittings on all of the, uh, the wet decks, for instance, or, or, you know, some of the high purity uh, wet process stations. Um, and I will say that uh, I, I owe a lot of thanks here to uh, Berkeley. I actually, uh, they did a lot of similar things in their tool move, and we had consulted them uh, quite a bit before we actually executed ours. Um, but again, we took a, you know, a pretty practical approach, standardizing our water manifolds, so we constructed all of the CPVC water manifolds that we've used for uh, tools and so on. Um, you know, we did have uh, a, a lot of planning, again, around safety and key activities, so we involved uh, environmental health and safety as much as possible. But there were a lot of things that, you know, we didn't have the expertise on, we didn't pretend to have the expertise on, uh, and, you know, even through some of the university policies we didn't want to touch. So, for instance, um, you know, we, con we contracted out for orbital welding. We contracted out for electrical connections from the main panel to a disconnect box, and then our staff actually, um, I have staff on, on, or I have people on staff with uh, electrical background. I do have one electrician on staff, for instance. So he would do the wiring from the tool to the disconnect, but the main feeds into the panels we hired out for. Um, any exhaust ducting larger than two inches uh, we contracted out for. Uh, and any complicated rigging. So you can see here, this is our stepper coming in on a 30,000 pound forklift. So, um, you know, things that were just a little bit beyond our scope. This is that eight foot uh, long, six foot diameter production level sputtering system I had talked about. Uh, this actually had to be hoisted up an entire story to even get to the loading dock. So complicated rigging projects like this we had hired off for, but most of the other tools, anything from, you know, small tabletop tools to 2,000, maybe even up to 3,000 pounds, our staff actually moved themselves. We bought our own rigging equipment and so on. Uh, so we, you know, got well versed in, in that process. Um, but then the other key thing was uh, process qualifications were, were done before a tool was taken offline. After we moved it, brought it back online, uh, process qualifications were conducted again, make sure the data matches before and after. And in some cases it didn't, so that was certainly something that we had to address. Um, and then really just the, and this, you know, Dennis highlighted this so much in his talk, the constant coordination and communication between all of the stakeholders. So the users, the vendors, campus facilities personnel, EHS, I mean, I can't say enough about the number of meetings and conversations we had to ensure that, uh, you know, all of this uh, was successful. So in the end, you know, there was about 80 pieces of equipment that were moved. Um, we did acquire and install six new major tools in the process. Uh, the whole thing took about three years. Uh, but we did manage to come in, you know, under $900,000 in budget. So uh, the university was happy, we were happy, and actually I'd say one of the advantages of doing this ourselves is now our staff have intimate knowledge of every connection, all the inner workings of the tools, everything needed to help them upkeep the lab and the, the, the equipment in the long run. Um, so I'm, out, I'm already slightly over time here, so I'll kind of just leave this slide up, um, you know, for you guys to read, but I'm happy to take any questions. You mentioned the uh, exhaust scrubbers. Could you also just touch briefly on how you deal with, uh, you know, solvent waste and acid waste? Is it a carboy system? Do you have a uh, system? So there, there's different ways that we handle different materials, right? So the solvents, all of that is captured. Uh, so, for instance, in the wet decks, we have five-gallon carboys attached to the wet decks. Um, so we have rinse stations. Uh, things of that nature, uh, like cup sinks, for instance. So that solvent waste goes directly to the carboy. Uh, any waste, solvent waste anyways, that is uh, in a beaker, that's all captured and bottled. And uh, actually, part of the construction of the facility, I mentioned the class one division two rooms that we have down in the basement. 
Uh, adjacent to those, they put in a uh, chemical storage room for hazardous waste. Uh, so our staff is fortunate enough, we actually have a key for that. So it's managed by Environmental Health and Safety, but they let us actually accumulate our own waste down there so we don't have to worry about waste pickups and so on. Uh, now acid waste, that's a different story. So we do have an acid neutralization system. Uh, there's double wall piping all through the concrete slab. Uh, there's also liquid level sensors uh, in that piping so that if there was a breach of the inner pipe, we would basically detect it in the outer pipe. Um, nobody's really planned out what would happen in that scenario, but um, and then there's an overflow trench that if you know there was a catastrophic event, Jane's into a 500 gallon holding tank attached to the acid neutralization system. So a lot of our acid waste can go down uh, into that system, but not all of it. So we do capture things like HF, we bottle that, and again, that goes you know, out with uh, uh, e, uh, EHS. So they have a collection group that comes every Wednesday and, and handles that waste. Um, you know, a few other materials, so like, for instance, TMAH, you know, it's neurotoxin. Uh, we cannot put that down the, the water stream. So again, stuff like that's captured. So it's a mix. Um, so we actually have signage at each of the wet decks indicating what can go down the drain versus what has to be bottled. So that's all laid out for the users individually on each deck. Yes. Uh, most uh, university clean room uh, are typically classified at class one hundred, class one thousand. Uh, why is yours uh, class one? And class and so there was a there was a huge argument over this in the initial planning meetings, um, and and the main argument honestly was. Well, that's what we had. So, you know, why are we going to downgrade? Um, I mean, that said, we did look at select use cases. Um, we had some really critical research going on over the years, and I don't remember the paper actually, but there was a paper put out by NASA looking at clean room classifications, um, you know, related to certain work activities. And so, we had referenced that paper, and I can look it up if anybody's interested. Uh, I think I have it in my laptop. But, you know, we used some data from that to justify for certain key projects the need for the class 10 environment. Okay. So uh, just a couple uh, real, real quick comments on things. Uh, one is for the uh, CDA for uh, backup system for that. Nitrogen's a great backup, so putting an auto switch over valve there. We don't have an auto switch over valve, but I know where the <laughs> secret valve is so that, that we've piped in so that we can switch it over when the, when the plant CDA goes down. And on the nitrogen generator, we have something very similar. Uh, we, our ROI on that was, uh, was a year as well. We we're probably saving $80,000 a year uh, on that. The, the only thing I'd say uh, on that, so we're, and we're uh, delivering at 99.5 is our purity, about, uh, similar to you, about 2,500 SCFH. And uh, I guess the, the, from a planning perspective, it takes a lot of CDA, so as you, as you said, or, you know, almost uh, just a little over 200, 250 uh, uh, CFM. And uh, so you need a good, good supply of that. But the other one is, and in that, in that mentioned it, it can be very loud when it switches over that, uh, the, uh, the, the silencer. We ended up buying a different silencer that worked way better than the one that originally came with it. So if you get one, make sure you put it in a place where you don't mind it getting a little loud. Yeah, and actually, just to that comment, one thing I forgot to mention was that we did install a uh, automated crossover valve between the generated nitrogen and the bulk liquid nitrogen. So if the generator does fail, so for instance, if the compressor shut down, you know that purge nitrogen is the generator nitrogen that we call purge nitrogen. <laughs> you know, it's feeding a lot of critical activity. So if that goes down, all of our wet decks shut down, uh, as as do a number of other things. So that crossover valve uh, basically will take the feed from generated nitrogen and then flood that line with the, uh, the bulk liquid oil off uh, in those cases. And it gives us time, you know, we would drain that tank relatively quickly, but at least gives us time to shut down key systems and conserve nitrogen until the uh, compressors are back up for the generator. So we did take redundancy as much as possible uh, into account for that. But uh, yeah, to John's point, that these systems use quite a bit of compressed air. Yeah. 